Okay, so welcome everybody to Community Energy Scotland's Carbon Auditing Webinar brought to you by the Carbon Neutral Islands team. I'll shortly pass over to my colleague Cameron Duff, uh, Community Energy Scotland's Carbon Auditing Officer for an introduction to the project. And this will be followed by a presentation by the community development officers involved today. Um, that's Neil Gow from the Isle Energy Trust, Scott Watson from Cumbrae Community Development Company, Reuben Irvin from North Yale Development Council, and Shona McLeod from the Vol from Voluntary Action, Barra and Vattersea. We'll also have Rosie McLeod McGuinness and Tom Lusink, who will join us uh, later on for the Q&A as well. The topics covered will be the audit process. Excuse me while I allow somebody else into the meeting. Uh, the audit process followed by the importance of locally specific, local specific data and the use of local knowledge, the use, using data in a community action plan and lessons learned. So I'll now pass you over to Cameron for project introduction. Thanks very much, Kath. And I'll share my screen quickly. Showing up okay. Um, so yeah, hi there folks. Thanks very much for joining us today. I'm Cameron, uh, one of the climate accounting officers on the Carbon Neutral Islands project, working for Community Energy Scotland. So just going to give you a brief overview of the Carbon Neutral Islands project and uh, some of the context behind today's webinar. So um, the project was born out of the Scottish Islands Act of 2018, where the Scottish government set out the ambition to deliver carbon neutrality for six Scottish islands by the year 2040, five years ahead of the nation as a whole. As part of this, the Carbon Neutral Islands Project, also known as CNI, is a Scottish government programme for government commitment, which aims to provide an important first step on this journey by supporting these islands to achieve this target. The Scottish government selected Community Energy Scotland as the key delivery partner for the project. The project considers one island from each of the six uh, local council areas which are responsible for inhabited islands. These are Barra, Cumbrie, Hoy, Isla, Rassi, and Yale. The project considers carbon neutrality as akin to net zero, where greenhouse gas emissions are in balance with sinks. Here, sinks considered include natural resources such as trees and other biomass or technological solutions capable of absorbing CO2 emissions. Here, carbon neutrality is considered for the following areas, electricity, buildings, transport, industry, waste, land use, and agriculture. Each of these sectors are captured under dedicated carbon audits, which are in alignment with the greenhouse gas protocol. These are intended to provide part of the evidence basis for community climate action plans for each island on their journey to carbon neutrality. The project is led by community development officers or CDOs from each of the six islands who are here to deliver today's webinar as Kath introduced. And the CDOs act as the central representatives uh, for the CNI project on their islands and for the CNI island steering groups on behalf of their communities. The CDOs and island communities are essential to the successful delivery of both the carbon audits and also ensuring that the community led actions for carbon neutrality are captured in the action plans. In addition to supporting island communities to reach carbon neutrality. A core objective of the project is to share knowledge and emerging good practices with other communities. As part of the commitment to fulfilling this, this webinar will provide an overview of the carbon audits, detail the importance of local knowledge, discuss how audits may be used in action plans and cover other lessons learned from the audit process. And we believe these will be useful to communities who may wish to complete a similar exercise. While CNI focuses on island communities, the findings are equally relevant and applicable to mainland communities. So first up, we have Neil Gow, uh, the CDO from Isla, who will provide an overview of carbon audits. Cheers. Hi folks, just tried to share my screen. We see that. That's all good. Cheers, Neil. 
Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, yeah, my name's Neil. Um, I work for Isla Energy Trust on Isle of Isla on the Carbon Neutral Islands project, and I'm going to give you a quick overview of the carbon auditing process that we went through. Um, so there are a few ways to measure carbon emissions, but for the CNI project, we chose to follow the <clears throat> Global Protocol for Community Scale Greenhouse Gas Inventories. It's a fairly standard and recognised method of carbon accounting that tries to account for emissions within a defined geographical community. It covers multiple greenhouse gases, but for most purposes, we only really need to look at three. These are carbon dioxide, the most abundant from human activity. Uh, then we have methane and nitrous oxide, which have higher global warming effects, but are generally found in smaller quantities. These are measured as carbon dioxide equivalent, and there are various emission factors depending on activity and emissions are calculated by multiplying activity data by an emissions factor for that activity. So we looked at uh, three different scopes. Scope one basically draws a line around the community, and then activity within this line is counted. Uh, this can be anything from agriculture to driving a car or burning oil for industry. Uh, scope two accounts for electricity that is imported to the area via the grid, and scope three picks up some emissions outside of the boundary. This includes things like ferry emissions or waste that is exported. There are pros and cons to this method. Uh, it allows for multiple places to be looked at together without the risk of double counting. And it is also a widely recognized methodology that will be understood by other organizations. However, there are limitations. Uh, there will be some things within these scopes that communities don't have any control over and there are also some actions that we could take that actually affect things outside of these scopes so what i would say is that it's a good base to work from but alongside it's also important to look at these things from a real community point of view uh, some of the results might be difficult to translate into community action um, and we should also look beyond these scopes as well to how communities interact with the wider world uh, as for when, we started looking at 2019 as a base year. Uh, the reason for this was that 2020 is not your typical year due to COVID. So in effect, 2019 was the last year with some good solid typical data, step, data sets to, from which to build from. Um, but where things have changed since then, we've tried to take these things on board. And an example for us on Isla was that some of our industry has switched fuel types since then. Uh, so some of the activities that we looked at, um, Community Energy Scotland oversaw the carbon audit for energy and transport. For energy use, this considered electricity and fuels for residential, commercial and institutional, manufacturing industries. Uh, so for us on Isla, we have a large distilling industry uh, that requires a lot of energy. Uh, then you have emissions from energy production and other energy uses associated with things like agriculture, forestry, and fishing. So we're measuring, measuring electricity consumption and other fuels like kerosene, coal, logs for heating homes, or other fuels for, for powering industry. Transport, uh, we have road transport, water transport, aviation, off-road transport, such as tractors and railways, which, which we didn't have. Um, so it's energy and fuel used for personal travel, freight traffic, bin lorries, et cetera, any journeys that occur within the community boundary, but it also accounts for some out of boundary journeys. And there's a bit of a quirk to the methodology here where it only counts emissions from outbound transport, not inbound. This is basically to avoid double counting with other communities. Um, but for us on Isla, this meant it counted ferry emissions, ferry emissions as half of uh, what they actually are on the ground. So it's just just highlights that we need to bear these things in mind when we apply these numbers to real life on the ground. The other part of the audit was for waste and land use and was undertaken by a consultant with experience in these areas. So biodegradable waste going to landfill releases methane, incinerations have incineration has emissions. Um, there are also emissions from wastewater treatment, such as sewage and septic tanks. But also industrial wastewaters can have emissions depending on their composition and a few other potential sources as well. Uh, agriculture looks at various farming practices. So enteric fermentation is methane from digestive systems of livestock. 
uh, fertilizer and manure also have an effect. Um, and for land use in general, basically you get different emission factors depending on different uses of different land types. So degraded peatland can be a big emitter or woodlands might be removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, but I have to stress this sector is of the audit is very complicated. Um, there's a lot of estimates and variables, and this is where a lot of big margins for error start to creep in. All data has varying degrees of confidence. Um, for us, energy, transport, waste had some reasonably good estimates, but it must be said that time constraints and a very large land area here meant that a lot of the land use audit had very low confidence levels. Um, but it's a starting point. And part of the project going forward now is to try to ground truth some of these uncertainties. And finally, just some quick information on the data collection. Um, we used existing public data sets. They're quite helpful, but they don't always tell you exactly what you need to know and not necessarily to the right scale. Freedom of information requests are also useful if you know the right questions to ask. Uh, but ultimately, a key source of data is from the community themselves. And this was essential throughout the audit process. And with that, I'll pass over to Scott from Cumbria, who will tell you a bit more about data. Thanks. Thank you very much, Neil. As Neil has, has said, I'm Scott Watson. I'm from uh, the Isle of Cumbria. And I'm the community development officer for the, the CNI project on the island, I'm working for Cumbria Community Development Company. Cumbria is the, the smallest of the islands in terms of the, the physical size within the project. However, we are probably the most accessible, being only eight minutes from the mainland. We have the second biggest population of the islands and the largest single town, all of which has contributed to one of the, the key lessons that's been learned to date about the CNI project that everywhere is unique, particularly when we're dealing with small communities, or in our case, island communities, and that the local data that we can get, get from this is therefore paramount to the success of a carbon auditing process. Now, whether you're looking at the carbon audit process from the point of view of a business, a local organisation, a community, or even at a national scale, data collection is an integral part of that process. As has already been covered, carbon auditing can provide an accurate and comprehensive picture of a community's carbon footprint and identify the opportunities for both mitigation and adaptation that are available to that community. However, as always, the output is only as good as the input. The Greenhouse Gas Protocol emphasises the importance of using accurate and relevant data. Whilst it provides standard emission factors that can be used for estimating emissions, these should only be seen as a fallback position when more specific data is not available. It encourages the use of local data, however it does also recognise that there can be a trade-off between accuracy and feasibility and that the data collection efforts should be appropriate to the decision-making needs of the company or that community. No matter how you look at it, local data will play an essential role in this carbon auditing process, particularly for community scale assessments. First, local trends tend to be more accurate than the broader averages because they reflect the specific circumstances of that community. For example, emissions associated with electricity use or house heating can vary greatly depending on the local energy mix. If a community gets most of its electricity from re renewable sources, and it relies primarily on electrified heating, then its emissions in this area will be much lower than the community that relies on coal-fired power plants or heating oil. Other examples, local bus companies will have different mileage, different models of buses. Local farmers may produce cattle for beef rather than dairy, whereas neighbouring agriculture may be more focused on sheep, chickens, pigs, or even growing crops. Second, local data is more relevant to the community. It helps to identify the most impactful carbon reduction strategies for that specific area. For example, on Cumbria, our transport emissions are heavily influenced by the ferry service that runs to and from the island. This would not be relevant for some of the neighbouring communities on the mainland. And likewise, we don't see the same amount of through traffic on our roads. 
Third, using local data can enhance the community engagement process. Uh, when the results are relatable and mirror the community's own experience, it encourages more involvement in that carbon reduction process. And finally, using local data ensures that the carbon audit process is equitable. Some communities might have higher emissions due to factors that are beyond their control, such as lack, lack of access to renewable energy or public transport, perhaps in our case, a ferry route being the only route on and off the island. Local data can highlight these issues and ensure that they are addressed within the carbon reduction strategy, as well as the potential to help prepare for the impacts of climate change by reducing the reliance on such external sources. Whilst national or even global data can provide a broad overview or even a starting point, it can also introduce several challenges or dangers when used for community scale carbon auditing. The primary issue, as I've already touched upon, would be inaccuracy. It's rarely accurately representing a particular community's unique circumstances. Factors like local energy mix, transportation options, industry presence, or even local weather conditions can significantly influence a community's carbon footprint. And as an example, if we used the local authority level figures for livestock on Cumbria and simply scaled them, then we would have a thriving dairy industry, approximately 10,000 chickens running around the streets of Millport, and 1.2 of a pig, um, which is not the case in reality, you'll all be glad to hear. In addition to potential inaccuracies, national level data may also oversimplify uh, or completely overlook the nuances that make our smaller, more rural communities unique from the larger towns or cities. The larger the scale of the data set, the more chance these nuances will be eclipsed by the average. It can also misrepresent the opportunities of carbon reduction in a specific community. The significant presence of a single industry on a small community may not be apparent at the local authority, national or even global scale. And the example I would use for this is the presence and importance of the whiskey distilleries in Ireland. Lastly, national data might result in less community engagement. And this is a really important part. If people feel detached from the data and that it doesn't reflect their own experiences or circumstances, then it will affect the credibility of the audit results. Credibility is a crucial element when it comes to community engagement and acceptance of the carbon auditing process, even more so when you're dealing with a small or even island-based community. A lack of credibility will lead to scepticism or resistance and will likely hinder the, or, uh, hinder the implementation of any carbon reduction measures. These are some of the examples of where we used local data, particularly on Cumbria. Um, we can maybe touch on some of these in the, the Q&A for anyone that wishes to. But in conclusion, data collection is a, a vital part of any carbon audit process. When local data is used, the auditing process can be more transparent and inclusive, enhancing the credibility of the results, which in turn will lead to better community buy-in. This type of data, whilst being more difficult and probably time-consuming, to gather captures the unique environmental, social, and economic factors at play within the community uh, that broad scale data often overlooks. I'm now going to pass on to Ruben, who will discuss how we then develop the actions and the plans from this data. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Ruben Irvin. I'm the Community Development Officer for Yale, um, up away north up here in Shetland. Um, so I'll try and get this to share my screen. Can everyone see that okay? Oh, I'm on the wrong slide. Apologies for that. Everyone see that now? Perfect. Excellent. So yes, um, as Scott said, um, I'm going to be discussing using data in climate action plans. Um, in terms of using your data, um, if you're looking at creating a climate action plan, the two main things you're likely to use your data from your carbon audit in are engagement. Um, so engagement with your community, if it's a community climate action plan, or in your organisation, if it's an organisational one. Um, and the other area will be in the action plan itself. Um, so that's the key area that I'm hoping to touch on today. Um, so why use it at all? Um, the main reason that I think data should be used is to uh, show people the change. Um, I think sometimes when you can look at where you are now, 
Uh, it helps you to look to where you might be able to go to improve. It might be to a full reduction, carbon neutrality in our case, or um, total zero in our emissions. It might be a 50% reduction. It might be whatever's required. Um, but that shift between where you are now and where you could potentially be uh, creates a tension that I think can drive things forward. Uh, it might also be helpful as well justifying your actions um, in terms of when you're looking to draw in funding, external or public funding, private funding. Um, you might need to be able to show your data to explain um, the change that you're going to make. So there is a justification element as well, but hopefully you're creating a tension that draws people forward with you. Um, the other reason um, is it lets you quantify your emissions and compare them to one another. It can help you target where you need to work. Um, you'd be surprised um, how variable it can be. Um, you might think you're going to go in and, and find one major emitter um, and it may end up being a totally different thing. Uh, I think it also draws people um, into the issue. When you don't know the emissions, there's a tendency to go uh, for people to say, we, we know that something emits, but it's small compared to a national level, compared to an international level. People like to compare it to China or America. But I think when you put a number on it, um, it can really help people to identify the problem and want to work with you towards a solution. Um, so I'll be quite quick, hopefully, over these slides. Um, I think it's good to think before you start what you might want to do with your data in terms of presenting it. Um, it can help you understand how wide you'd like to go. Uh, I quite like these single static bars. Um, they work well for things like this, help you show your emissions are out of total emissions, um, in our case for our island. Um, as you can see, there is a, there's a couple of downsides with these. If you have a very dominant emissions sector, in our case, land use, it can kind of cram up some of the, um, the other emissions. Um, for instance, waste in our one appears very, very small, um, but it can give some relative scale. This can also be an issue for presenting sinks. Um, so beware about how you might present sinks if you're lucky enough to have some. Um, not, not an issue in our case, unfortunately. Um, but if you do have sinks um, or if you're having issues of data being crammed up, uh, a standard bar chart can help. You can put your sinks down below the x-axis, um, which is nice and clear. It also helps to spread out the data if you need to, so you can have emissions above and below, um, so you get more, more space um, with that one. Um, within sectors, I think pie charts and donuts are quite user-friendly. Um, I've pulled out the car one for this one. So it can be quite clear what bit you're speaking about. Sometimes you might find, in our case, we have ferries. Lots of people here would like tunnels. I have to mention that one. Um, and uh, But at, at the end of the day, replacing our ferries would be a huge infrastructure project. And at this stage, it's not something that we can look at. Um, so you might find that you're, you're looking at your car transport, your LTV, your HGV, maybe your buses. Um, but actually, looking at ferries can be quite difficult. So you might find that there are areas that you want to pull out and look at specifically. So I just thought I'd uh, give you a little summary on, on some of the data presentation because it might help direct you to what you need to, to look at in your audit. Um, it's not all um, good presenting data. Sometimes it can be demotivating. Um, sometimes there's things that you maybe can't do a huge amount about um, or won't be able to change. I think that can be sort of unengaging. Um, in our case, we have a lot of peat. Um, so that would be a very long-term project, a huge project. It might not have huge community benefit, um, hopefully not a negative, but in terms of getting people interested in some of the small areas, uh, you look at the chart that I showed the first one, uh, how do you engage people in waste if you've got this huge peatland issue? Um, so it can sometimes push people away, so you have to be a bit careful. Um, it can also look to blame people. Um, so peat might blame farmers and crofters, um, or if you have a big industry, um, industry could feel that they're sort of blamed for those emissions. Um, and even right down to the level of the individual, um, you know, some people can read the report and say, well, they've attributed these emissions to car driving. Um, and actually that can feel like blame rather than like you're working towards something. So it can be important just to um, sort of make quite clear that it's about making change rather than blaming people and, and trying to make people feel negative. So that really comes into being careful with context, I think. Um, and lastly, the, the data in the plan is, is only as good as the underlying audits. Um, you quite often need context for accuracy. Quantifying the accuracy of your audit is going to be difficult. Um, 
you'll be aiming to have um, sort of data on every sector. Um, and, and so having two sets of data on one sector can be very difficult, but that's the only way to, to quantify the error. For instance, we were able to estimate electricity use um, sort of a bottom-up approach, um, figure out uh, domestic and industrial use and so on. We also got data from substations um, and there was a small difference there, but that gives us an indication of where the error is. And you can try and understand maybe things that you missed in the bottom-up approach or errors, or maybe there's an error um, in a top-down approach as well. And so that comparison can, can indicate your accuracy, can indicate where you have errors. Um, in some places that, that just won't be possible. And so um, you do need to sort of uh, state state where there are inaccuracies and errors um, and be clear. Um, if you do have gaps, if you, unless you have a very, very small, very closed system, um, you're quite likely to have gaps. Um, and, it, and it is difficult because um, you then need to say, well, we also have these emissions, but we aren't able to sort of accurately quantify them. Um, and that can be quite difficult as well. Um, if you're presenting graphs, how do you present present things you don't know? It can be quite difficult, but it's it's worth considering. So in terms of what can you do with these, you need to tell people, be transparent. Um, otherwise, it might come back to bite you. Um, if, uh, if things change, if you don't know, you need to just be clear. Um, that's the best that can be done. Um, and be flexible in your action plan, I think. Um, try, when you're writing it, think about, you know, if, if we've made a mistake, what would we do to come back and, and change this? Uh, if we found new emissions, if we found we'd overestimated emissions, um, is the action plan created uh, in a way that makes it flexible to change? I think Ruben might have lost his connection. That was spectacular timing because I think he's just about finished. Um, rather than waiting for him to come back, <laughs> uh, uh, Cameron, I don't know if you want to try and link in smoothly from there. Yeah, not to worry. I'll bring up the slides. Well, I think that's fundamentally it, really. I think that's on the, the last point there, so. From uh, Ruben, yes. Um, and now we have so, Shona. Yeah, next up, Shona, if you want to jump in now. Yeah, I'll just go. Um, so. There we go. So, um, I'm just following on from Ruben here. So my name is Shona and I'm the Community Development Officer for Baran Vatrice. I will be covering quite briefly the lessons learned from the carbon auditing process. So Baran Vatrice have a population of roughly around 1200 as of mid 2019 and they are the two most southerly inhabited islands in the Western Isles. So going into the audit process, it was expected that Baran Vashti's highest emissions would be related to transport. This is due to the islands having two dedicated ferry routes. There's a once daily sailing to the mainland to the port of Oban, and there's a sailing that goes multiple times a day connecting Bara and Eriski. These vessels that are on the routes are they're pretty old, so we kind of knew that, well, we thought that there would be quite a lot of emissions associated from this. But it was quite surprising to see that the domestic energy consumption was pretty high. Um, it's a domestic energy consumption estimates are assumed to include consumption from self-catering accommodation, which really should be under commercial and institutional energy consumption. However, there was a bit of uncertainty around the share of non-domestic housing and how this would be accounted for. So until we can do some more on the ground truthing of the data, this is something that we need to work on. Um, oh yeah, so sorry, my second point here, um, it's that Baran Vatsi's highest source of emissions was actually from Lulu CF. So Lulu CF, 
stands for land use, land use change and forestry. It was actually 44% of the island's total emissions. When this data was first received, it was in a form that was not very easily understood by myself as CDO and also by the steering group. Uh, anyone who wasn't really up to speed or up to a high level of understanding with the carbon auditing process or emissions calculations, it wasn't in an understandable form. So we had quite a few meetings with the consultant Ether, who was in charge of doing this data. And after a while, the understanding became clearer. But this is an area that needs quite a lot of work for Baran Vatrice, because what was used was a lot of sample data and relying on national and modelled outputs. So there is quite a high degree of uncertainty in this audit. So challenges in the audit process at the beginning, there was delays due to establishing data protection agreements within the local community. So with the community development officers, with the local anchor organisations, so in my case, voluntary action by Vatrice, and with Community Energy Scotland. So this missed time frame really meant that there was a lack of time available to collect on the ground data just within when the audits were being done. This was coupled with long wait times for getting access to national data sets, which held quite crucial information that was then used in the audits. So that's definitely an area that going forward was a, quite a sticky spot, so would need a wee bit of time set aside. There was, as Neil mentioned, kind of on the first little presentation you listened to, but there was a discussion on the flexibility between island specific requests and the chosen methodology that we went through for these carbon audits. So the decision to only include outbound journeys was seen as quite a point of deliberation because some islands felt that there was a responsibility to account for all these emissions associated with these journeys, particularly because these routes, their main purpose is to serve the island communities and Without that need, there really wouldn't be any reason for the journey to happen. Ultimately, it was decided for the sake of consistency to keep it the same throughout all six islands because this is in line with the greenhouse gas protocol. And the third point here is working closely with the auditors. Um, the energy and transport audit, which was actually done by Community Energy Scotland, we as CDOs worked really closely with Cameron and Dara. Um, and it was quite handy because there was a, very open to feedback and allowing the steering groups to be involved in the auditing process and seeing the information. And they were really open to feedback when new information did become available. On to the lessons learned side of things. Um, as I mentioned before, the time scale to collect data was very tight. Due to this, there was not as much time as we would have ideally liked for collaboration between the community development officers and the contracted consultants to make sure that all data used was accurate and really represented the communities. Because of this, there was frustrations on what data was a priority from a consultant point of view, but also from an island point of view, and who was also responsible for sourcing this information. Having regular check-in meetings with consultants and with the island community would definitely help to resolve this area of uncertainty and build stronger relationships going forward. This, so the understanding between the consultant and the local community is also true of the data that was used. Using modeling outputs is, important in some cases but for example in the agriculture audit sector the modelled data sets were not representative of the island communities and this was seen as an area of importance on Baron Vatrice so what was done was a representative from each crofting township was interviewed an approach to get a better understanding of the livestock numbers and the land management practices so that it was more accurately reflected in the bar chart that Ruben had showed in the previous presentation. 
A thing that we talk about a lot is to keep the audits and to keep the CNI process as living documents so that they'll be continuously revisited and when new locally sourced information becomes available, it is easy to include it in the process. This has really helped as well for understanding where data gaps are on the islands and where we really need to focus ground truthing efforts and where they would really be of most value. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. I'll just pass back to Kath for questions, actually. I don't have a nice end slide, unfortunately. That's all right. Thank you, Shona, and thank you, Neil Scott and Ruben also for your presentations. Um, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, Colin Buchanan from the Isle of Ling um, is a uh, community trust is asking how has marine activity or industry been captured? He's thinking specifically of personal and tourist boats, fish farms and fishing fleet, which for a small island like Ling is likely to um, be a large proportion of activity. So not even um, ferries. Um, so this is quite a good point, I think. Does anybody want to take that up? Um, I can dive in unless anybody else has any specifics they'd like to add. But generally, we have um, captured all or as much as possible um, personal and tourist boats um, within the transport sector. Um, that includes, um, you know, um, boats used in fishing industry as well. So ultimately, it falls under the transport sector. Um, the kind of, kind of main issue, I suppose, around these areas is getting the data in the first place, as is you know <laughs> being spoken about a lot of the time. Um, but in terms of uh, fishing fleets and so on, if it's uh, if you have contacts with the organisations, it's really just about a case of you know trying to make sure you have good relationships to try try and get get that data from them. Make clear that you know as we've discussed as well, it's not about blaming anybody. And you can make you can anonymize information and so on as well um because ultimately all that matters is understanding really where the emissions come from not about or they're you know the the figure itself rather than pointing a finger at anybody um so we went through this exercise as much as possible for um, for all the islands but it's um you know it's uh, tricky in terms of time scales and uh, managing relationships and so on but um if you're looking any more specific things, Colin, yeah. just let us know. Yeah, I guess I guess I was really interested. Do you just capture all that? Do you, if you've got a fishing fleet, everything associated with that becomes your data. That's what I'm getting at. Yep. Yeah. Um, so as long as if it's activity which leaves from the island and comes back to the come island, back, come back to island, it's yep. fully counted by the island. Okay. Yep. Um, and there are some quirks in the methodology kind of when you've got pass through journeys and so on about which share of emissions is is captured and um, but we'd be happy to you know give you a bit more specific well, we're, yeah here. we're surrounded by fish farms so that the boats are coming and going all the time you know so you just yeah. take a proportion of it i guess yeah okay yeah not to worry if, if you want any more specific answers just let us okay know. Um, okay thanks Thanks, Colin, and thanks, Cameron. We've got a couple more questions in the chat, but I'm going to go to Brian first because he's got his hand up um, from Climate Hebrides. Thank you, and um, thanks, everybody. It's really stimulating uh, morning so far. Um, can I just pick up, Cameron, you, you were talking about consultants and various other people doing these activities. So Climate Hebrides, um, we're waiting to hear back from the Scottish Government whether we're taking forward the climate hub for the Western Isles. And um, one of the things that we're very keen on is training local people to be able to go and deliver these greenhouse gas um, audits. And so I suppose one of my questions is, what training did any of you go on to deliver these uh, audits? And, and then secondly, it comes back to the consistency and one of you showed a slide earlier on and it said, I can't remember who the organisation, there was a logo on the top of it. So perhaps if someone could put in the chat who that organisation was in terms of the methodology of the audit, I think that would be really useful. Um, so I suppose what I'm trying to say is, how do we get consistency 
across everywhere so that we're all using the same um, matrix and um, we're all using the same methodology. And finally, my point, uh, one point was about the boats coming in and off islands. So I need to speak to the Highlands and Islands Climate Hub to see if they're going to undertake a similar activity with doing audits for the other end of the boat's journey. Um, so again, if we can all try and collaborate together, I think that's the, the thing that I'm trying to get across here very badly, I know, but anyway. Yeah, um, again, I'm happy to jump in. So first point, um, everything, uh, as we'd mentioned, was done through the, the greenhouse gas protocol. Um, in this case, we use the um, community scale inventories um, methodology. So they have a few different methodologies depending on uh, what you're specifically trying to do. Some of that's corporate accounting, um, but this one, we felt the, the community scale approach was best. I think it's called the city scale inventory, but uh, it's for communities. Um, so yeah, in, ter in terms of training, there are um, courses online, which you're able to do, which we undertook internally at CES um, and uh, some of the CDOs undertook as well. Um, so that's uh, available through the Greenhouse Gas Management Institute. Um, uh, and in terms of the ferries, Yep, that's uh, and the consistency generally. That's one of the kind of main points is is this about the I suppose the overarching methodology. As long as you're consistent with the greenhouse gas protocol, it should you know limit double counting and so on. Um, that's one of the the main points. Is uh, as we've discussed, it's a a quirk is the inclusion of only departing journeys. But you know the principle of that is hopefully that other communities are linked up in the same journey to the same exercise so it's only counted once um scott if you have anything to add there yeah just coming at it really from the, the sort of cdo's point of view my experience in this area was fairly limited um when actually taking coming into the post as a as a development officer um so you do end up with a very initial steep learning curve but I think one of the biggest takeaways from this is how quickly this, this field is moving, um, be it land use, be it uh, transport sectors, et cetera. The understanding of it all is moving so quickly. So I think regardless of the experience you have in this field um, or the training that you do, you have to fully expect that you're going to be learning new things every day and that it's going to, your understanding of certain areas will change very rapidly um, because no one person that I've met yet seems to know all the answers to to each of these these sectors, and um, so it is constantly changing and constantly evolving. Thanks. Okay, thank you both. Um, Kath, sorry, quickly just got a message from Ruben. He's back online, but um, any chance you could let him back in? I think. I can't see him. We're waiting in the waiting room. I've been keeping an eye out. Oh, not to worry. I'll drop him a message. I I'm not sure what's happening there. Ah, there he is. Okay, he's on his way. Thanks, um, Okay, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we've got another question here from Colin Meek. Um, I'll read it out. It's quite uh, a long uh, question, so it might be easier if, in case you don't remember everything you, you typed out, Colin. Um, it's been mentioned that consultants are needed for the Lulu CF. Um, and Colin saying Lulu CF is probably the highest emitter for more rural areas. Um, this cost of using consultants could be a significant barrier for some local communities. Um, do, do we think that this part of the audit needs consultancy input or could it be un undertaken using local expertise and volunteers? Or could this actually be an issue whereby local organisations could come together to share um, their expertise and share the costs. Who would like to take that? Thanks, Cameron. Yep. Um, this is, you know, very much a, a key concern, um, you know, in this area going forward is trying to, you know, strike the balance between some areas being very technical um, and, but the importance of using locally led data, but it's, uh, I mean, I, I <laughs> I don't know if anybody else uh, from uh, from the CDO perspective would uh, like to comment on this as well, but I think ultimately it's an area we're trying to look into is um, 
you know, you know, trying to identify where local groups and so on have the expertise that are relevant there to, because it doesn't really help, you know, if you're just handing off the money and handing everything off to a consultant, because the fundamental point of this is that you update it um, to allow for benchmarking. Um, so if you, if you don't have that as part of it, then it's, uh, you know, people, it's a fundamental part of the exercise. Um, but I think it certainly could be done where the local expertise does exist. Um, but obviously then you kind of get the balance of, um, you know, it's a, it's a big time constraint as well for uh, communities. So ultimately I think it depends, <laughs> which is uh, not much of an answer, I'm afraid, but um, Scott, you've got your hand up as well. Yeah, as, as I think all the CDOs would probably um, agree with me on, when, once you start the community engagement process um, around the audits and around the data that's coming in, it's amazing how many local experts you suddenly find in certain areas. And I don't mean that tongue in cheek, I mean it uh, genuinely. Um, we've found on Cumbria that we have a lot of experts that have maybe retired and moved to the island. So they know these areas very well. And that's happened, I think, across the board on the other islands. Um, so yes, I think there are definitely opportunities there for local experts to get involved in that. I think one of the big keys there would be consistency, particularly when you're working as part of a project such as the, the CNI project. Um, but to answer your, your final question there, yes, I think local organisations coming together would make this a lot easier um, for those organisations it would help with costs. Um, and as we go into the ground truthing element of uh, what we're trying to do with the CNI project now, we might have a better understanding of how much can actually be done locally as well, as opposed to the kind of broader overarching um, stage that we're at at the moment. Yeah. Neil? Um, oh, on you go, Neil. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was just going to say that you know the the land use side of things for us in particular, like like I said, we had we had very low confidence in the data that came back anyway, and it was it was a good experience, it was a good learning experience. But now now we've all been through it, you know, I I definitely think there is more scope for it to be done locally and maybe a bit more targeted. Um, one of the things I, I remember, I think it was possibly Scott said this a while back, talking about data when you when you have the data, so what. Um, that's the first question you should ask. And if if you've got land use data, but you can't actually use it to to uh, you know if if some of the some of the some of this some of the actions that you need to take here are just really out of your scope and not feasible, then it's it's kind of yeah a, a bit of a targeted approach. But I, I I definitely feel like for us as well, there was a lot of local knowledge that that could have. Um, that probably could have done just as good a job as as a consultant. No disrespect to the consultant, but <laughs> um, it was yeah, yeah. Uh, Would absolutely agree. I suppose one of the the key things to consider, Colin, is um, just making sure that you know pe people have um, read the guidance from uh, the greenhouse gas protocol, and there's plenty. That's all ultimately based on the IPCC guidance, which I think was from two thousand six and updated in two thousand seventeen. Um, so just keep people's eyes on updates um, where they're available um, and you know fundamentally making sure the same methodology is used for consistency and also transparency um, but it's uh, yeah in terms of costs um, we need to remember that this this is sort of still at the very start of an evolving area of work um, one would hope that as this becomes more and more common or the demand for this type of um, this type of work by communities increases, one would hope that funding would be put in place to help with the costs if a, if a community felt or a group of communities felt it was more appropriate to use um, paid consultants in, in, in any area of, of their audit work. Um, we do have another question from Adele Liddedale, um, who's asking what the biggest benefits or the, the biggest positives of the project have been so far for the island communities. I guess that possibly would be different for 
each representative we've got here. We've got about eight minutes, seven minutes left. So maybe an overview would be good from, from someone. There's Tom there, if you want to dive in. Yeah, well, I'll just speak roughly, I'd say, the sort of benefits I'd see from us. Obviously, we're very much at the beginning, really, of this project of what is happening on the islands. Uh, the most obvious is that, well, with our project, we've now got people employed who are from the island, living and working there. Um, throughout the engagement process of gathering the data, you're dealing with the community. And I think overall that has a positive um, effect because people are feeling listened to, you're hearing what they want, um, and just the act, that act in itself, I think, can be beneficial for people. Um, in terms of the process and like how we get to any of the benefits, we got all this data, we collected the data and we presented it to the community. Um, and it was from the presentation of that that we then collected ideas in. And all these ideas that the community said, all of them were listened to and ranked. And that, that's how we done on RASI at least. And basically they're in our community climate action plan, which is more or less done. Um, and it is from those actions that we will be putting deliverables down, hopefully this year, uh, with a small amount of capital budget. So uh, all being well, the actions that have been ranked from, from that, you know, those are the things that the community most wanted to see. They're not things that we've made up. It's not something the government's made up. It's what the community said. So that is what will be delivered this year. So of course that hasn't happened yet, but if that goes ahead, I think that would be the biggest positive. Um, and that would be sort of just a quick overview for myself. Okay, thanks, Tom. Anybody else got any um, benefits that really stand out at this stage of the audits that they've done locally? Yeah, community community buy-in. I, I touched on this just a bit in, in my presentation, but this, this, this is an area where there's so much information coming out every day. Um, it's very difficult for people to either, so it's very common for people to either switch off to that or to know where to start and to, to follow along with it. Um, so by having a project that is community led with a member of the local community actually at the face of it, as, as Tom's touched on there, has really helped the local community on Cumbria to buy into this. Um, there is somebody available to explain the benefits, not just on a global scale, but on a local scale. One of our biggest issues in Cumbria is domestic energy. Um, I would say it's very difficult for people sometimes to think about climate change and what's happening when they're struggle, struggling to pay their energy bills and they don't necessarily put the two together uh, when the reality is that we are able to do things through the CNI project that will have a direct impact on their standard of living and their ability to heat their homes, et cetera, whilst also working towards the larger uh, goals of the, the CNI project. So I think that's been a, a big benefit for, for Cumbria, um, actually bringing a small community like that along on this journey and helping them to understand their part in it. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Scott. Does anybody else have anything to add to that question or does anyone else have another question before we draw to a close today? I think that might be us for questions. Okay, well, thank you ever so much for coming along today. I hope those of you attending the webinar today have found it useful and informative. Uh, the recording of this will be sent uh, through to everybody who's registered for today's event, and we'll also send you a copy of all the slides as well. And I'd like to thank everyone who's presented and everybody who has helped with the answering the questions in the Q&A and those of you who've asked questions as well. I hope you have found this a worthwhile uh, way to spend an hour of your time this morning. Many thanks. Thanks, guys. Um, I'll just pop my email in the chat as well if anybody has any um, follow up queries, even just generally about carbon auditing or um, any you know community level uh, specifics about that. Um, I'll just do that just now. 
Thanks, Cameron. Thank you.